So now we're going to talk about part three, um, which is the final part of uh, chapter 10. Originally, I thought it was only going to be two parts, but I realized that we needed time for a third part. So if you think about what this is going to cover, this is um, everything in the chapter after the discussion about sexual harassment. So um, this is called um, making a difference. Um, this is looking at women's career development, looking at high achieving women, um, talking specifically about work-life balance research, and looking at um, changes that are going to have to happen going forward, um, both at the individual level, structural level, and societal level, changes that are needed for women's equality in the workplace. Women's career development, striving for success. So what is driving career development for women? Well, achievement motivation is uh, something that has been studied in psychology for swipe, really since the 50s. And this is basically um, people's desire to accomplish something valuable and important and to meet uh, whatever high goals or standards they've set for themselves. Um, it used to be thought that women didn't have achievement motivation, ha, <laughs> back in the 50s. Um, but it's now recognized that women and men have very similar achievement motivation or motivation to achieve, uh, but that that motivation ends up being channeled perhaps in different directions um, often. Um, so there's uh, different ways or different models or theories out there um, about achievement motivation for women, but the mo sort of the most prevalent um, is what's called the expectancy times value model. And this model actually um, explains how women make decisions uh, related to their achievement motivation. Um, and uh, there's really two parts, the expectancy and the value, okay? So expectancy is referring to... Um, uh, and an individual's expectations of their success in a particular career, um, and that um, interacts with their values, um, and that's how the, their value that they place on, um, or they think what is important to them. Um, so the expectation of their success, um, and then the values uh, that they hold interact then to um, affect their uh, achievement related decision making okay so the expectancies that a person has of themselves are shaped by um, the expectancies their parents have of them also their beliefs that they have about their gender role and um, and then also how they're socialized their gender socialization um, so that's where the expectancy part of the model comes from um, and then the um, the subjective subjective value uh, values that people have, again, are also shaped by um, uh, parents' um, beliefs and gender socializations, okay? So um, both men and women may place strong values on having a career, right? And a lot of studies have shown this, that women and men both have strong values um, or strongly value having a career, um, what, what, what the research has showed, though, is that women, uh, unlike men, have a high value on having children, um, which then affects their career planning. Um, if you ask women about their plans for what they plan to do when they have children, men always say, oh, well, my career will come first. And the women say, oh, I'm either going to stop my career or I'm going to cut back on my career when I have kids. Um, so the men are consistently planning to put their career first. The women are not. So the women end up ha having less knowledge uh, than men about the fields that they plan to enter. Um, they, they know less about the training that's needed in the field, and they know less about how much they could earn in the field. Um, and they aren't getting as much relevant work experience um, for the particular career that they plan to enter. So although they have expectancy and they want to be successful, their values on having children um, are driving their planning and preparation for their future career. 
Um, so that's problematic. Okay. Um, so in other words, um, the women's values about family life were um, leading them to do less planning and preparation for their future career life. Okay. So um, that, that's, a, that's a problem. And that's just an example of um, how the expectancy times value uh, model can be applied. Now, it can be applied equally well to diverse ethnic groups. Um, uh, so that's a positive. It's, it's not just for, um, for white women. This is uh, a model that we can use to um, do research uh, on work, uh, work motivations for lots of different um, groups of women. Uh, it does suggest that getting young women to enter uh, rewarding non-traditional careers is doable, um, but it's going to take support from moms and peers. It's going to take learning about feminism and instilling a belief in gender equality in, in these women because these are non-traditional careers. A lot of them are STEM careers um, that um, it's important for women to get into not only because... Um, uh, those jobs pay better, but also just that uh, they may be suited to the women's um, interests in terms of math and science. Um, uh, a 19, uh, I'm sorry, 2016 longitudinal study found that um, the math self-concept um, in women uh, and the combined with their or interacted with their lifestyle style values to predict uh, women entering STEM fields. So again, this showed support for the expectancy times value model. Okay. Still, few women experience uh, professional career success. And that's, it seems like a strange statement, but it's it's pretty true. Um, the women that do experience professional career success, um, the number of them compared to men is small. So what makes these women different? Is it somehow their background? Is it, is it personality? What, what's driving high-achieving women? Um, well, they come from backgrounds that provide with them, them with a relatively unconstricted sense of self and an enriched view of women's capabilities. So a simple way to say that is just that, um, you know, in their background, they had sort of basically a, a non-traditional um, upbringing. They were believed to, be, they brought it to believe that women could achieve whatever men could achieve and um, that there was uh, less gender stereotyping um, uh, in their households where they grow, grew up. So, um and oftentimes they had employed mothers, um, especially uh, mothers who enjoyed their work and who were successful at it. Uh, those mothers provided an important model for achievement. Um, we also find or find found in studies of high achieving women that fathers who supported achievement in their daughters were especially influential on those daughters. Um, there are variations among successful women. Um, some women uh, uh, who did not have these particular successful um, or particularly successful mothers or these particular characteristics that we have that have been found to predict achievement succeeded anyway. Um, some women report having been spurred on by a disapproving parent or by attempts to hold them back. Um, so. Uh, they were not predicted to be successful, but they were. So these odds-defying achievers, um, overall, the common trait they tend to have is that they have an unusually strong belief in their abilities to control their lives and to believe that you could do anything if you put your mind to it, right? Um, so uh, it's also important to note that models of career development have been always been based on heterosexuals. So the process of coming out and being accepted as LGBTQ is personally demanding and may de delay career development. Um, so this should be taken into account when we think about uh, career counseling uh, for women 
um, and uh, uh, for any, anybody uh, who is um, not a heterosexual um, in the strict sense. And that, that's another variation that um, may not be, have been predicted previously in research, um, and, but should be looked at in future research. Um, women who have achieved top-level career and leadership success um, have often forged their own independent paths rather than um, going along a typical path uh, taken by a man. Um, uh, so their career success uh, is not necessarily because they're spending all their time at work, uh, but it may be most often because they're good at, at time scheduling and multitasking. Um, these, these moms are not super moms. Um, they, they are not worried about baking cookies or selling Halloween costumes. They are delegating and outsourcing at, at home just like they do at work, right? So let's talk a little bit about work-life balance, um, the balancing act. And this is managing both to have a career and family. Um, and uh, this, is, this is difficult, not just for, for men, but for I'm sorry, not just for women, but also for men. Um, uh, this is uh, this is something that uh, people deal with every day in two career households, um, and um, it does fall on the woman more to um, because women are still expected to to handle more of the unpaid work. It does fall on women more to. Um, have that double day or that uh, that almost full time jobs, two full time jobs, um, which that is changing, um, and we see that more and more egalitarian marriages. Um, but that is a that can be problematic. Um, we also see role conflict and role overload uh, for women who are trying to strike this work life balance. Um, role conflict being that psychological effect that that that. Uh, occurs when women are faced with two sets of incompatible uh, demands. For instance, uh, when women are feeling torn between work obligations and family obligations. Uh, an example of this might be um, uh, uh, have feeling that you need to be home with your child and you need to be at work in a meeting at the same time. Um, or role overload, which is um, actually when you're having difficulty meeting um, expectations of your two different roles. Um, and this, an example of this is um, maybe you need to work overtime on a short notice and you have to scramble to find childcare. Um, so uh, you end up trying to call babysitters while you're trying to finish a, a, a work report, right? So that's that role overload. So. Research has consistently shown that women workers experience this role conflict uh, on a regular basis, um, and also that chronic role conflict and a role overload are linked to guilt, to anxiety, to depression, and they can contribute to greater fatigue, uh, having a shorter temper, and having lowered resistance to illness. So these are definitely issues that uh, women work in the work world or experiencing. So what are the benefits of finding a balance between work and, uh, and uh, life at home? Well, uh, there's lots of benefits and there's lots of costs of not finding a balance. Um, the value of finding the balance is uh, if you do find that nice balance, you have better mental health, better physical health, better relationship qualities, and more satisfaction in your job, okay? Um, uh, your job or your career is generally a source of great self-esteem and um, a better social involvement. Um, and also success in your work domain may help you keep a sense of perspective about other domains, has been, which has been found in previous research. Um, employment also increases women's power in the family and provides families with higher income, which benefits everyone and reduces the, spe the pressure on the, uh, the um, other spouse. Okay. Um, uh, in 2014, there was a study looking at both men and women uh, that found that poor 
work-life balance was linked to more health problems um, and that the best work-life balance um, has been found in Scandinavian countries such as Sweden, Norway, and Denmark where government policies are family friendly. For instance, they have things like paid family leave, etc. So let's wrap up this part three on chapter 10 um, and talk in terms of sort of the big picture, making a difference in terms of uh, women in the work world. Um, well, we can't just look at the individuals and how they should change. We also need to look at how the workplace itself could change. And this is more of a structural level approach. A structural level approach focuses on the impact of the organizations on the, on the people um, by the organization on the people that work in them. So, um, so this is taking more of a social psychology approach where uh, looking at the context, the work organization, and then that, how that shapes a person's behaviors. So um, recognizing that the work organization or the system has to be changed for, their, for equality to be achieved for women in the workplace. Another perspective that needs to be um, taken into uh, consideration is the intergroup power perspective which is the showing that um, uh, when men have more social power than women, women are then treated as an outgroup. Um, and this whole um, notion of the in-group and the outgroup are is reinforced by stereotypes about differences between men and women. So we have to make fundamental changes um, in, our st in our how we stereotype men and women um, in order to um, alter the power structure, or we have to make fundamental changes in the power structure um, in order for women not to be treated as an outgroup, okay? So in terms of specifics, um, equity for women workers is not gonna take not just striving by individual women, but it's gonna take some structural level changes um, seeing women's issues as similar to issues of other disadvantaged groups um, at the structural level. Um, in the past, legislation for equal opportunity has benefited women um, as well as other disadvantaged groups, um, but we still need family leave policies and affordable high quality child care. Uh, those structural changes need to happen um, at the organizational level. Um, we also need increases in intergroup power um, we need to be educating people about stereotypes so that women are no longer seen as the out group and men as the in group. Um, and we need to increase women's political power is another way to, to increase women's social power. Um, and by doing things like um, electing women as leaders in our government. Um, well, you can see that organizational psychologists um, are working to eliminate gender bias in hiring and promotion, which is another way that women will be helped uh, in the workplace. Um, <clears throat> developing clear criteria and timeframes for performance evaluations will discourage cognitive biases against women like stereotypes. Um, and if we are able to increase the number of women in the applicant pools, um, that will also uh, help eliminate gender bias in hiring. Um, if we also can uh, work on having, uh, as psychologists, having policies and training in place that prevents sexual harassment, um, this will also help in terms of gender bias um, in promotion. Um, so these are things that all can make a difference in terms of uh, uh, helping women out and help them develop uh, more equality in the workplace.